This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Welcome to episode 122. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. This is the last of the off-season episodes, and so I'd like to thank Steph Storer for stepping up and helping to provide you with content for the last couple of months. Now, the new season, which starts on September 13th, is going to be a bit different than what you're used to, but you're still going to get all the same amazing content and all the great guests that we've had in the past and a bunch of new ones as well. On this episode, Steph chats with critically acclaimed author Elizabeth Fremantle. Elizabeth has published four Tudor and Elizabethan set novels, which you may or may not be familiar with. Elizabeth is here to discuss the ever scandalous Francis Howard. You'll want to stick around to hear about this wonderfully noteworthy figure in history who we seldom hear about. And we'll also learn today about an announcement that she has to make. Some of you may already know about it. Before we get to the interview, I need to thank my newest patrons, Amy Pye, Terry S., Suzanne W., Therese, and Julia. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank all of my existing patrons as well. A full list can be found at TudorsDynastyPodcast.com. If you'd like to show your support, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty, and then click Become a Patron to learn more and to see what wonderful things I give you in return for your generosity. All right, with that, let's get on with the show. And now, Ask the Expert. Welcome to episode 122. I'm your Ask the Expert host, Steph Storer. On this episode, I chat with the fabulous author Elizabeth Fremantle about the fascinating Frances Howard. Now, Frances is not one of the more well-known figures of her era, but I can promise you that you will not want to miss out on the drama behind her. So sit back, relax, and hang out with me and Elizabeth. Without further ado, a warm welcome to Elizabeth Fremantle. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. I think we should start this episode, uh, if you would, by giving us maybe a quick biography of Frances. I once read her described as, quote, a maid, a witch, a countess, and a whore. And I definitely think many of our listeners who don't know her will want some of the background info on maybe each of those titles, right? So let's hear what we can maybe about her family, her upbringing, right through her scandalous marriages, and the drama with a certain Sir Thomas Overbury. Certainly, yes. And she is a less known character from the court. And in fact, strictly speaking, she's not really a Tudor woman. Most of her life was lived in the Stuart period. However, the kind of threads of the beginnings of her story were all uh, generated in the Tudor period. So because it's all about court factions and... um, Those court factions went back through history for for some years. So she was, Frances Howard, she was the daughter of the Earl of Suffolk. The Howard family, we know the Howard family. They're, you know, Anne Boleyn was a Howard, uh, Catherine Howard, you know, both. So both the executed queens of Henry VIII were Howards. They're a really controversial family, always in the mix with their power plays throughout the whole Tudor period and on into the Stuart period, as we're going to see. So she was incredibly beautiful and a daughter to this big, powerful family who had lost their traction at the end of Elizabeth's reign. So they were clawing their way back to power when James I came to the throne in 1603. The Howards helped James onto the throne. And so they kind of came back into favour and they were back at court. But they were still, they had to kind of negotiate their power quite carefully. So Frances, the very beautiful daughter, became a pawn in all of this. And this was quite normal, that women were married off to kind of create alliances between powerful families. But this, she was um, married off to the Earl of Essex. His father was famously executed also called Robert uh, Deverux. He was uh, very young. He was 13. She was 14. And this was 
a political marriage. This was to unite two houses, more than houses, really, two court factions who were really had been at loggerheads for years. And so it was a kind of a uniting of two opposing forces through this marriage. And it seemed like a great idea as a kind of court power play. And so the two, the young couple were married and it was a huge wedding, almost as big as a royal wedding at court. It was a really big deal. It was one of the first huge weddings of the the Stuart court. And then they were too young to live together. So it was quite normal in those days that a couple of that age wouldn't live together. You know, it would be too girl was would be too young to really reproduce it was considered a bit dangerous but of course what they wanted was a son to cement that and to be kind of heir to all this power that they'd claimed but anyway so Robert was sent off on a kind of grand tour around Europe the courts of Europe for a couple of years and she went back to her family and then she was sort of introduced to court and um she, as a great beauty and very witty and extremely engaging, she attracted a lot of male attention. Not least Henry Stuart, who was the heir to the throne at the time. He he had a bit of a soft spot for her, but she also caught the eye of Robert Carr, who was the king's favourite. And king's favourite, I mean, it's we it's it's very hard to know. for sure, but Carr was widely considered to be the king's lover. Um, And Carr really, really fell for Francis. So so by the time Essex had returned from abroad and the couple were supposed to behave like a married couple and live together, there were all sorts of other things going on. And they lived together for a little bit and they really, really disliked each other. So it was not only problematic on that front but also problematic because the faction that belonged to they were a group of people that were loosely around Henry Stuart the heir and they were kind of devotees of the executed Earl of Essex and they and the Earl of Southampton and they were a very powerful faction at court but they were kind of allying themselves to the one who would be king after James. And of course, then Carr comes into the equation, who is increasingly powerful because he has the king's ear, he has the king's favour, and the king will do anything for him. And so Francis's extremely powerful uncle, the Earl of Northampton, he's her great uncle, who's the kind of head of the Howards, He decides he wants her out of the marriage with Essex and he wants to marry her to Carr. Carr's up for it, she's up for it, and they're going to make Essex annul the marriage. Even the king's up for it. He won't refuse his lover or his favourite anything at all. And, you know, a powerful marriage was a very important thing for for a courtier to... You know, they needed to have heirs. They, you know, he was going to be bestowed all sorts of titles. He would need heirs and he'd need to establish himself within the court. So everybody wanted it. But of course, none of the Essex lot wanted it. And so there, there was a court case to annul the marriage. Francis and her her faction maintained that the, the marriage was unconsummated. Therefore, there was no marriage. They could both be free. But uh, Essex didn't agree with this. That became a court case that became very prolonged. They were arguing and it had to be judged by a uh, jury of bishops. And they were at stalemate for months and months and months. And Carr had a very dear old friend who was a sort of mentor to him uh, called Sir Thomas Overbury, who was really not an important person at court but he was he was a kind of a minor courtier I suppose and um he was very he hated the Howards and he was very much on the side of the the Essex crowd and so there were tensions between him and Carr and their friendship was 
kind of stretched to its limits because Carr wanted to marry Francis, who was a Howard, and he he didn't he didn't think it was a good idea. And he had information that he said he was going to expose in order to stop the annulment from happening. So a little deal was done, no one behind the scenes, no one really quite knows what happened. I think the, the king offered him an ambassadorship in, I think I can't remember quite where it was, to go to Russia or somewhere, Mongolia or somewhere quite, quite a long way away to get rid of him. And he refused to go. So then they said, oh, well, you're refusing the order of the king, so we're going to put you in the tower. So there he was, Overbury was out of the way for the moment. But he was still causing problems and still threatening to speak out and prevent the annulment from happening. And then some some would say somewhat conveniently, he suddenly died in the Tower of London. And the annulment went through, and the the new couple, Carr and Francis, were married. And it was another enormous wedding, like a royal wedding, and the same man married them who'd married her in her first wedding. So the whole thing was completely absurd, really, when you think about it. And they were they were made the Earl and Countess of Somerset, and they were riding high, the absolute it couple of the court. And of course, the Essex faction really didn't like this. So there were all sorts of machinations going on behind the scenes and they uncovered, they either fabricated, we don't know, or uncovered some evidence that said Overbury didn't die, he was murdered, and that the Somersets were in the frame. So this it couple were, you know, slammed into the Tower of London and another court case happened and they were tried for murder. So that's a kind of potted history of of um, Francis Howard. And But I think there are some more questions to answer. Thank you so much for that background. So now we can get to our listener questions. I can't wait to even to get going with this. So our first question comes from SB250. So as you mentioned, the first marriage to Robert Devereux um, went very sour, to say the least. And it sounds to us like the courtroom antics were really just right out of a television drama. There was a lot of talk of potential not consummating the marriage. There was impotence, all kinds of things. So the first question, it's going to make a few people blush here. (laughs) It has been said that Devereaux actually showed the room his stuff to prove his masculinity and that he was not actually impotent. So can you talk about this situation at all? Does this ring a bell for you? Yes, I'll try not to be too X-rated. Yes, right. (laughs) This is a family show. I think more accurately, he didn't actually show his, uh, shall we call it a tumescence, in himself before all the bishops. But he, he had his friends testify that one morning he had lifted his nightshirt and shown them that he was very capable of having consummated his marriage. But it was uh, only Francis who made him impotent. He uh, So his friends testified in the court that they had seen all that business and that he was perfectly capable of it. And then um, she, I mean, he said awful things about her. He said... Uh, he, you know, she was terrible to him. She reviled him and miscalled him, terming him a cow and a coward and a beast. I mean, these two really didn't like each other. Yeah, so I think it's it's a it's a slightly less saucy version of the story. Um, he didn't actually have to uh, uncover himself in the courtroom. I think we would have had. It's still pretty saucy to have all your friends come in and say, "No, no, it works." <laughs> Certainly capable. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. Again, they were trying to prove this to win the annulment and say that they never consummated the marriage. So our next question from Thomas B. said from her side to kind of prove her virginity, uh, even though we 
think we know she probably was cheating with Carr anyway and not really a virgin. But to prove that she had not consummated the marriage to Devereaux, she was also examined in the courtroom. And word rumor has it that she actually had a stand-in to cover her face for modesty's sake, I guess. Um, so this woman covered her face and let them examine her. They said that it was Francis, and they proved that this was a virgin. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, well, there is some truth. Um, I'm, I'm, but I tell you what, it didn't happen in the courtroom. So it was really... Well, that's helpful too. <laughs> it was really normal in a, a case, an annulment case, that there would be a virginity test, what's known as a virginity test. So some midwives would have to inspect the girl to see if she was still intact. Make of that what you will. Um, so this was set up. Uh, virginity test for Francis and we I mean it's very easy to assume that she had slept with Carr or slept with Essex or slept with any number of men but let's not forget that with hindsight she was labeled a whore very early on in this case She's the one, oh, Francis Howard, the whore, you know, Henry Stewart, Stewart was after her, Francis, Francis Carr, uh, uh, Robert Carr was after her, she's leaving her marriage. You know, she was the fallen woman. So we all know how the rumour mill works. So it's quite possible that she really was a virgin, but we'll never, never know that. And she was inspected. And there's a wonderful little rhyme, which I've got here. I'm going to read it out. This dame was inspected, but fraud interjected, a maid of more perfection, whom the midwives did handle, whilst the knight held the candle. Oh, there was a clear inspection. So that's alluding to the rumour that went round saying that they'd substituted another girl for her. And actually, I make a bit of that in my novel, because it's, it's a kind of a great scene. I mean, it was a rumour, but it was it was only a rumour. We just don't know how true that is. I mean, it's great to speculate on. But she was she did undergo uh, an inspection. Whether it was her or not, we'll never, never know. I love that little poem. That's funny. <laughs> and we'll definitely come back to your novel at the end of this. Thank you for mentioning that because that was a good one for everybody that's listening. But first... We'll go to Allison222, uh, who asked a question about the love triangle between Francis Carr and King James. And of course, as if this could get any more like a soap opera. So she has the annulment. They're all done. She's going to move forward with Carr. But as you mentioned, he is already in somewhat of a relationship with the king. So if that were the case already... Our listener, Allison, wanted to know, was Carr then in love with the king? Was he in love with Francis? Was he just placating the king? Because you don't necessarily cross that guy. If he liked you, you got to just act like you like him back, you know? Was he in love with both of that? Where were the loyalties, I guess, in this triangle? Okay, well, let's unpick this a little bit because it's quite a complicated story. And and also, we... Uh, we don't know definitively who loved who or, you know, none of those things are really provable. He really fell in love with Francis. And it's my belief that he, he was bisexual. The king, the king had form. I mean, the king had a series of very close favourites. Um, he had, um, he was estranged from his, his wife with whom he, he'd had, Four, pre I think she'd had four pregnancies. I think one there was. I think there was a girl that didn't didn't live beyond childhood. But there, anyway, there were the two boys, Henry and Charles, and there was the girl Elizabeth. Um, so you know that was obviously functioning as as it. But but that was duty as well. I mean, royal duty had to produce heirs. But he had, as a young man, he had a favourite called Esme Stewart, who was a, a, actually a cousin of his. And Esme Stewart was slightly older, very gorgeous and glamorous man. And when he died, James kept his heart in a box forever. Make of that what you will. You know, 
you don't really keep someone's heart in a box. I mean, not only gruesome, but you know, that's a that's the action of a lover, I think. Um, but it's complicated, you know, that I think the language of friendship was very different in those days. And, you know, men made kind of these sort of they, they talked about love between men and it wasn't necessarily sexual love. But I do think with James, you know, there are there are letters there's there's so much that supports um the fact that he he was in love certainly with the, the three men Esme Stewart Robert Carr and then George Villas who who was the actually I've got an extract of a letter that James wrote to George Villas who was the last extremely handsome favorite um and James says I desire only to live in this world for your sake and that I had rather live banished in any part of the earth with you than live a sorrowful widow's life without you. And so God bless you, my sweet child and wife, and grant that ye may ever be a comfort to your dear dad and husband, James R. Now, I mean, that takes a bit of unpicking, but, you know, that's a love letter. And, you know, I asked a couple of sort of proper historians what they felt about whether James had proper homosexual relationships with with his his uh, his favourites, and of course, there's no proof because there's never going to be a child to prove it. There's you know these are acts that take place in private. Um, so I asked a Stuart historian. Dr. Samantha Smith, and she she said, I'll, qu- I'll read her quote, she said, there's no denying that James I was fond of his favourites, who happened to be young men, but we cannot say for certain if this attraction resulted in sexual relations. There is no actual evidence to support such claims, and the act of sodomy was in fact illegal and deemed a sin in 17th century England, and James was a man who feared sin. So it may be that they didn't commit sodomy because James was a very very religious man but James was certainly in love with Carr he was certainly in love with Esme Stewart he was certainly in love with George Villas and he probably wasn't in love with his wife (laughs) they really didn't have you know they they kind of got all their children out the way and then they led completely separate wives so I think um I think what we can say for sure is that they did, there was love there. Whether Carr felt as passionate about the king or whether it was more that Carr was a man on the make, a bisexual man on the make, who had attracted the king and thought, well, you know, that I can really rise up through this. We don't really know. I mean, Carr, he wasn't a man of great character. He wasn't, you know, he was, he wasn't, um, necessarily a particularly Machiavellian type of man he probably just sort of blew the way the wind wind took him um but yeah so I can't really really answer whether he loved James but there was certainly a relationship there that was you know sufficiently strong for there to be things that James could have been blackmailed with um during the the court case when the the Somersets were tried for for murder, um, because uh, there was talk of um, some kind of blackmail that could have happened between Carr and the King. So, you know, it's it's certainly possible that all sorts of things went on, but we'll never never know what they were. We will never know, and that is so frustrating because those kinds of things are what we want to hear all this juicy gossip it's crazy this whole story is so crazy it's great fodder if you're a fiction writer because the, all the things you don't know become i know and then you can just turn it into what you want it to be well or you can you know you can create mystery around it yeah. of course you can mm-hmm. and now thank you again for kind of segueing us into the murder because now we can talk a little bit about Overbury. And Katie Ray, friend to the show, hi Katie, has written in asking about why originally, if, is there actual record that tells us why Overbury didn't approve of the match between Francis and Carr? Or was it really just kind of old family arguing type things? 
Well, I mean, I think I alluded to it earlier, but really it was Overbury's re- strong dislike or real loathing, I mean, really, to put it um, uh, accurately, of the Howard family. He was really suspicious. He belonged to the other faction and he really didn't like Frances. He thought she was bad news. Um, so, and he, and he was fond of... Um, he was fond of Carr. He was his sort of mentor. I mean, it's possible they'd also been lovers. We don't really know that. So there could have been an element of jealousy in it. Um, also, he felt he was going to lose his influence over Carr um, if she marry, if he married Francis, because, of course, then he'd be out of the picture because they'd be in with the king and Overbury would lose lose his, the influence that he had. So, I th- but I think really the main reason was his strong antipathy for the Howard family. He, you know, he was really suspicious of them. And believe you me, they were not nice people. They were like a, a kind of mafia uh, family. They, you know, they were brutal. And Northampton in particular. So yeah, that that's my take on it anyway. <laughs> Okay, so now a little bit more with the plot with Overbury. So they find him dead, and there is some talk now of him possibly having been murdered by these two. Now, if we move forward a little bit, after they look into things, the History King wanted to know, why was Francis pardoned but not released then? Oh, okay. And that's interesting because, well, I'll I'll kind of go back a bit. Um, So what happened was there was a little bit of time between Overbury's death, which was then deemed of, you know, he just died of, um, you know, some horrible illness in the tower. And he was buried rather hastily, I might add. And then it was a couple of years later or 18 months later, and by that time, the two were married, they were riding high. So 1615, they're arrested after this new evidence came to light. Somebody, uh, an apothecary's assistant, said he was he was paid £20 by, by uh, Francis Carr to... Um, give some poison to deliver some poison tarts to the prison for for Overbury so we don't know if if he was paid to say this if it really happened nobody really knows and it's impossible to really get to the bottom of it either because there's always so much kind of you know wheeling and dealing behind the scenes in these kind of things but um there were a number of people involved with this uh Anne Turner who was a serving woman to Francis and another a guard called Weston and then two or three other other men they were all tried and executed for having delivered these tarts and extra poison and I mean it's all pretty gruesome reading the the the, the poisons he was supposed to have ingested and had delivered to him and the description of his body and all of that is really, really very unpleasant. So these these lot were executed one after the other. And so Frances was at that time, she wasn't in the tower, she was in under house arrest. And so she would have heard of her friend Anne Turner going to the gallows and all the others. And it must have, she was also at that time having a baby. So, I mean, things were not great for her. And then um, Carr was in the tower at the time and then she, once the baby was delivered, she and baby were slammed in, in the tower as well. And they waited for their their trials to come up. So they she confessed, Frances confessed. Now, what we don't know is if she, um, she made a plea bargain with the king, perhaps, because um, she com- confessed kind of very unproblematically. And that might have been why she was pardoned and had the death sentence commuted. Um, But Carr maintained his innocence and he was still found guilty as well. Um, So they were sent to the tower, they were condemned to death and that's it. And then they were pardoned. And the idea is it's possible 
We don't really know. It's possible that Carr had something on James and perhaps it was proof that they'd been lovers, which would have just been an appalling scandal for for everybody and the, the king and everybody. I mean, it was really, you know, sodomy was, was a capital offence as well at the time. And... Um, or it could have been that James was just a little bit sentimental about his the man he'd loved for so long. I mean, he was very much involved by this time with George Villers, but we don't really know that. It's my belief that Francis had made a deal with the king and that she knew she'd have her death sentence commuted. It's all possible. And of course, there's no actual proof about this. But if you really look into all the evidence and all the papers and what we do know, it seems fairly plausible. So they were pardoned, but they stayed in prison. Um, they were, when were they sent to, 1616 was the, their trial. And then, the, so they stayed in prison until 1622. And they were released and had to go and live a kind of fairly quiet life. And then Francis died 10 years later, possibly of uh, cancer of the womb. I mean, we don't really know that because it is also the sort of thing that might have been used as a cautionary tale. You know, look, this wicked woman who poisoned a man and she was a whore and a witch and all these terrible things. And, and then she died of cancer of the womb. You know, it was sort of worst thing that could happen to a woman. Um, so we don't know, but that it has been said that that was what what, uh, what killed her. So... Yeah, they, and I think also back to the the question, I think that, you know, James wasn't a king who executed people as readily as his, the previous monarchs, so Elizabeth, she, you know, she was fairly trigger happy with the executioner's acts. Um, you know, she was quite ruthless when she had to be. And, um, well, we all know about her father and what he was like. And he was, you know, things were pretty bad. And and Mary Tudor, she she uh, was, wasn't shy about sending people to their death. But James, I mean, he'd... There, so um, so Walter Rawley, he, he was executed under James, but it wasn't... I think James was a much less ruthless, particularly about his, you know, people that he'd been fond of, you know, maybe he was a little bit more sentimental. So, yeah, so there, there, are, there are various reasons why they didn't go to the go to the block. But, you know, they didn't, their lives are effectively over. Well, our last question comes from Ryan Parker, who actually wanted to focus a little bit more. I know you had just mentioned that she was accused of witchcraft. So, again, Ryan says that she's heard that among all the other accusations, that one of the things she was accused of was witchcraft. So how does that fit into the story somewhere? Okay, well, you know, for a start, witchcraft was not an unusual um, accusation when women were involved. You know, it was always, if a woman was bad, she was probably a witch. Um, but there was a sort of funny incident with this woman, and it was to do with Anne Turner, the servant who was executed and a ring and that the Anne Turner had arranged for Francis to go and consult this woman for a, she was a kind of slightly witchy woman who did made predictions. And uh, so we don't really know what happened, but she um, had sort of put her, had reared her head and she was considered a bit too witchy. And, um, so that all kind of rubbed off on Francis. But those, those uh, witch, you know, women were accused of being witches all the time in those days. And, you know, if someone wanted to bring down Francis Carr, everyone knew that James had a great antipathy, antipathy for, for witches. He'd written a tract on it. And so it was possibly just a kind of vague rumour that... that some of her enemies had wanted to rub off on her, and it did. But it wasn't really part of the trial. It wasn't, you know, she certainly wasn't a witch. She may have been a very wicked woman. She may not have been. She may have been a completely innocent pawn. We really, really don't know. And they, I sort of, 
I try and explore in in my novel. It was really fun trying to explore both sides of her personality, whether she was one, either one or the other. And and you know, we just don't know. I don't think you know. I don't think she was a witch, and I think she was too clever to really believe in witchcraft. But Anne Turner, on the other hand, she was. She did dabble in sort of slightly dubious witchy kind of stuff. So, you know, and they were very much, they were very, very much in cahoots, the two women. Yeah. But we won't know. <laughs> but that was a big topic at that time, too, with King James. Um, so, it, you know, you're correct. If If any woman just did anything bad, that probably is what they were going to be accused of. Yeah, yeah. So Elizabeth, I have to thank you so much for being with us today. I know that I just think this is such an interesting topic. Her story is so crazy that I can't even believe that it is a real story, but you have turned it into, I definitely want to make sure that our listeners know that you have turned it into a novel as well. So do you want to tell us a little bit? And again, I have, I can personally attest to how good it is because I've read it myself. But it is called The Poison Bed, and it is, again, about Carr and Elizabeth, or sorry, Carr and Francis and the Overbury plot. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about where we can find that book? And if you have some other books, anything else you want to let us know about? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, yes, well, The Poison Bed is is exactly, it's it's all set around this story. but it, And it's kind of, it's a psych, psychological thriller. It's a, a noir thriller set around this story. And um, yeah, I think that's available in lots of places. It's certainly available in the UK and the US. Um, and um, it's an, and I've written also a kind of companion piece to that novel called The Honey and the Sting, which is, is just out in paperback here in the UK. And that continues on with the story of George Villas, so James's next favourite. And it goes, it's it's a little bit further on in time. Oh, I love that. I'll have to get that one next too. Perfect. Yeah. So that and that that's fun. That's another thriller. So it's a kind of revenge suspense thriller. Um okay, excellent. And now the next thing I want to talk about before I let you go is I know that we have a big announcement for you, another you know, you guys hear, heard it here first, kind of a situation for all the Tudor's Dynasty listeners. So what can you tell us about your upcoming projects, Elizabeth? Okay, well, I have written four Tudor court novels. And the first one was called uh, Queen's Gambit. And that is now going to be uh, made into a feature film starring Michelle Williams, which I'm obviously thrilled about. She's really one of my favourite actors. And so I'm very, very excited. It's filming at the beginning of next year. And um, it's not going to be called Queen's Gambit for rather obvious reasons, because that title has been kind of rather, rather taken from us. Um, but it's going to be called Firebrand. And so, yeah, watch this space, because uh, it's going to be a feature film and I'm really really excited for it we're excited for you so just to recap we want everybody to listen to uh read the poison bed we want you to read the honey and the sting is that what you said it that's, was called the second one that's the other thriller yeah yep the uh, so those are about the stuff we talked about today and then if everybody here wants to go look for the book called firebrand uh we can look forward to that becoming a movie and we will be able to say that we talked to you and we heard it here first. So thank you again, Elizabeth. We're so excited to have you. Um, are you on social media? Can we talk to you on Twitter or yes, Instagram and all that kind of stuff? Liz Fremantle on Twitter, one E in Fremantle. Um, yes. And I'm on Instagram, EC Fremantle on Facebook. Elizabeth Fremantle. I'm pretty much around and about the place, but if you put in Fremantle with one E, you'll find me. And uh, yes, and I should just add that, in fact, the 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 no novel, my novel, Queen's Gambit, is still out and available everywhere as Queen's Gambit, but it will be reissued as as Firebrand. Certainly in the UK, I'm not sure about the US, but it's still, you know, it's still available. It's in print. 
Perfect. Well, we're looking forward to reading all those and we can't wait to watch when your book becomes a movie. So thank you again and congratulations and good luck on everything in the future. You are more than welcome. Thank you very much for having me. And that concludes this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please show your support by leaving a review wherever you listen. Reviews are some of the greatest gifts that you can leave a podcaster because it suggests their show to people who may not have even known it existed. So thank you so much for your support. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening.